Welcome and thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. We are the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSIAC, one of three IAC domains in the DoD Information Analysis Centers operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DOD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. CSIX serves as one of the premier information research partners and curators of technology advancements and trends for the cybersecurity and information systems community. As such, our organization supports those working in the cybersecurity and information systems domain of DOD research and engineering. We do so by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. With an understanding of the cybersecurity and information systems DoD research and engineering landscape, we provide research and analysis services. We help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope you enjoy this webinar presentation and that it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DoD cybersecurity and information systems research. Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining this webinar presentation. My name is Philip Payne. I'm the technical lead for the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSIA. Uh, before we get started, I would like to note a couple of administrative items. First, if you are dialed in by phone and would like a copy of the slides, uh, they were posted to the CSIA webinar announcement. You can go to csiac.org forward slash webinars and find today's webinar. When you click on it at the bottom of the announcement, it will say download presentation. Uh, second, all participants are muted, but feel free to chat using the attendee chat window on the lower right hand side of the webinar screen. You can use that to chat with each other and I'll be monitoring that chat. Uh, however, if you'd like to pose a question for the Q and a session at the end, uh, please click the 3 dots labeled more slash panel options to bring the Q and a window as up as part of your layout. At the end of the presentation, I'll go over the Q and a uh, for the benefit of those on the phone. I will read the questions out loud to the presenters. Uh, if you have any technical issues during the presentation, please have no fear. The full presentation will be available online. Uh, check back to the CSI website. Once the webinar is posted, the GoToWebinar button will take you to the YouTube link. Uh, with that said, I would like to introduce uh, today's pre presenters uh, from the Government Accountability Office, uh, BJ D'Souza and Wes Coyle. Thank you. Thanks, Phil, and thanks everyone for attending today's webinar. We're really looking forward to it. My name is VJ D'Souza. I'm a director in the information technology and cybersecurity team at the U.S. Government Accountability Office, um, and I'm joined by my colleague West Coyle. Um, I'll spend a little bit of time giving both. Uh, we'll spend a little bit of time giving both for backgrounds in a few minutes. But um, today we're going to talk about a product that GAO has called the Cybersecurity Program Audit Guide, or CPAG. And we're going to provide an overview of it, and hopefully this will be useful to you in your work in the cybersecurity area. It's intended primarily as a resource for folks that are doing cybersecurity audits or evaluations, but it certainly is useful for a number of other uh, things as well. Uh, I'm going to start. Um, let me start by sharing my presentation. Give me one second. All right, just confirming um, that you can see it. Let's see here. All right, I got a thumbs up. And great, thank you. All right, so we're going to start by giving a little bit of background about GAO. 
just because some of you may not be familiar with who we are and what we do. We'll talk about some of the cybersecurity challenges that GAO looks at that we think are important for both the federal government as the nation as a whole. I'll also provide a few examples of our cybersecurity related work and West will provide some examples as well. And that'll lead us into our discussion of this program audit guide. We'll go over its components and explain, provide some examples of how it can be used. And then we can talk about some of the use cases for CPEG. And then we'll have time at the end for feedback and Q&A. Um, you'll see at the end, we also have, um, we also have an email address. We're soliciting feedback on this. Like anything in cybersecurity, as soon as it came out, we recognize that we need to plan for revising it. Um, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. So let me start out by talking a little bit about GAO. Um, so one thing to know is GAO is a federal agency, but we're part of Congress. We report to the legislator or the, the legislative branch, not to the executive branch. <clears throat> so that means some of the things we do are a little bit different. Our primary goal is to provide independent oversight of executive branch programs. So we issue audits and evaluations. We started out primarily doing financial audits, but that's really a small portion of the work we do. Most of our work is performance audits. So we evaluate how well federal programs are doing in every area, not just IT and cybersecurity. We're over 100 years old and we've got offices across the country. We've got a total headcount of over 3,000 people. One thing that I think is special about GAO is our agency head, who our current agency head is right there, Gene Dodaro, is appointed for a 15 year term and is appointed in a nonpartisan manner. And that is goes to speak to the our goals of having objective fact based analysis and audits and evaluations. So when we look at the area of cybersecurity, um, when we look at the area of cybersecurity, um, we break it down into four major challenge areas, and I'll go through each of those here. Um, I see that I have an echo. I'm not really sure if there's a way I can fix it. Um, I apologize if Phil has a suggestion. I um, can do it, but uh, I'll plow forward in the meantime. <clears throat> so, the first area is the importance of an overall comprehensive cybersecurity strategy for the nation um, and effective oversight of that. So, you all have probably heard about the Office of the National Cyber Director and the National Cyber Strategy. We've definitely taken a look at that and have had some suggestions on its implementation. <clears throat> Within that area, we also think supply chain risks are important. We know that's something everyone's dealing with, um, and it's still a challenge for federal agencies and all entities. Um, we've also stressed the importance of cybersecurity workforce challenges and the importance of emerging technologies such as AI and Internet of Things and Zero Trust and all the other buzzwords that we know you all are struggling to deal with these days. Now, the second challenge area, and this is the area that's most relevant to CPEG, is securing federal systems and information. So, GAO looks at the implementation of government-wide cybersecurity initiatives, um, but we also look at weaknesses in individual federal agency information security programs. If you work in the federal space, you're probably familiar with FISMA. Every agency is required to have its inspector general do an annual FISMA evaluation. Um, GAO um, also compiles all of those FISMA evaluations and does periodic reporting on the state of um, information security and cybersecurity government wide. And we've especially called out the importance of effective federal response to cybersecurity incidents. We see every day email hacks, data breaches, other issues that affect the federal government, but also other entities. And having an effective response program to that, both, both at the individual agency level and government wide, is also important. This third area is interesting because it's really mostly not the federal government. Uh, we talk about protecting cyber critical infrastructure. Most critical infrastructure in the US is owned and operated by private companies. The government certainly does have a lot of it, but not most of it. And it's a tricky relationship for the federal government to provide oversight and partnerships with these private entities in a way that's effective. 
And the last area deals with privacy and sensitive data. All of us have been victims of data breaches, I'm sure. And um, we think that that's a big problem and something that we need to do more about. GEO's had an outstanding, um, we call it a matter for consideration for Congress for several years to develop standardized national privacy legislation. And uh, we think that that's something that's important. And we also take a look at privacy uh, activities at individual federal programs and um, also whether sensitive data is handled appropriately. Now, within GAO as a whole, we have an information technology and cybersecurity team. That's where West and I work. Um, we've got about 200 people across the country, and we look at information technology, cybersecurity, and privacy and sensitive data collection. Um, more specifically, that means looking at IT management and IT acquisition issues. Um, we look at the extent to which federal agencies have adopted IT management best practices, and then, of course, protecting information systems and cybersecurity, which is what most of today's presentation will be about. And then we talked about the importance of protecting privacy and sensitive data. Some examples of our recent work, just to give you a flavor of the types of things we've looked at. Um, we do government-wide work, uh, such as the first report mentioned, the high-risk series, where we pull together um, actions, and that's basically the graphic that I just went through. But we also do agency-specific work. Um, this report was done at NASA. Um, we also have work um, underway and issued at the Department of State, um, as well as many other agencies. <clears throat> and then we do look at emerging topics. We're doing a lot of work now, as is everyone around AI, and whether or not AI is being effectively implemented and governed at federal agencies. Um, and that's probably an area of increasing growth. Now, before we go further, we wanted to stop and get a sense of your cybersecurity background. So, um, Phil, if you could run the first polling question, uh, and in the meantime, I'll use that as an excuse to provide my background, and Wes can then jump in. So, I've been at GAO a little more than 20 years, and um, I've worked in a wide range of areas. I've done, obviously, a lot of cybersecurity work, but I'm also doing a lot of work now looking at DOD financial management systems and DOD's efforts to um, strive for a clean financial audit opinion, uh, and I've also worked in healthcare and data analytics. Um, West, can you talk a little bit about your background? Sure. Um, so I'm assistant director for the uh, Center for Enhanced Secure Cybersecurity, which is within the larger uh, IDC team. Um, and I like to say that I'm a recovering CPA. Um, that was my career early on. I uh, never trusted the computers that generated the financial numbers. And so this, this launched me into an entirely different career, really, of, of reviewing computer security. Uh, and I picked up a bunch of certifications along the way um, from Microsoft and Red Hat and Cisco and AWS and, you know, it, and the, the more industry ones like uh, uh, the CISSP and CISA and, and Certified Ethical Hacker uh, and on and on. But uh, uh, it, it's it's been a, a quite a ride. The uh, the the rules for uh, for accounting don't change that fast, but uh, obviously computers, the security around them, uh, and, and the vulnerabilities around them, uh, uh, they, they change quite frequently, and uh, it, the, the the velocity of change is is picking up, obviously, and uh, so it's, it's it's fascinating to see that even the um, all, all of the criteria that we use, all, all of the uh, the guidance that comes from the various entities to, that that uh, provide requirements, uh, those are changing rapidly too. So it's a it's, it's an interesting field for sure. It's yeah, it's all gameplay employed. Yeah, that's definitely true. There's always more to do than we can do in each day. And I think that's, you know, that's both a blessing and a curse, but <clears throat> there's always a lot to learn in this area. And that's one of the things I like about, and that's kept me engaged for so long. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. Um, it looks like we've had um, about two thirds of folks um, provide responses. Um, and I'm not sure if the answers display or not, um, but it looks like we've got a mix of 
we've got a mix of experience levels. Um, the majority are somewhere in the middle, which is great. So you'll know enough to hopefully see what you can take from this guide. And hopefully uh, as we get into CPAC, it'll give you some tools to build on your knowledge and responsibilities. And with that, we have one more polling question, uh, which we'd like to run, which is just to, for those of you who do have cybersecurity job responsibilities, um, if we could just get a sense of the type of work you do. Most of CPAG is obviously most relevant to option B, testing and evaluating controls, but um, it certainly has value for the other areas. Those of you who work in other areas are always dealing with, uh, for better or worse, auditors like us or folks internally who are testing your work. So it's helpful to know <clears throat> how that's structured and what sorts of things people are looking for as you do it. Um, so we'll let this run uh, for a little bit um, just to get a sense of folks' responsibilities. I think uh, one of the things I did want to mention while we're waiting is, you know, I think one of the great things about um, our audit teams at GAO is the breadth of experience we have. So Wes comes from our most highly technical area and him and his he and his coworkers have specialties in areas such as databases or firewalls or servers, and we're able to provide a, an integrated team of them to do hand, hands-on technical evaluations. But we've also got a lot of folks who look at policy, and I can see here we've got a number of folks on the um, webinar who work in policy, and that's great because you know there's there's a, a whole lot of policy in this area, and a lot of it needs to be looked at. Um, but also the other thing we do is we have subject matter experts in every area. So for example, when we do an audit at DOD, we have folks at GEO who specialize just in DOD and we're able to have them help us understand kind of the subject matter, like what, what is the mission value of particular IT systems? Um, and so I think that's something that's unique at GEO and we really, um, are able to do effective work that way. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll now. And uh, again, it looks like most folks, um, they're oh, having trouble getting, there we go. Looks like most folks are in policy and management, but we have a large number of people who do test and evaluate control. So hopefully, again, as we go through this, um, this will be helpful to you. I'm going to go ahead and close the polling window just so I can pay attention to the presentation. And all right, let's plow forwards here. Um, so CPEG, I know that was a lot of background wind up. What is it? it? Again, it stands for Cybersecurity Program Audit Guide. And basically we issued this guide to codify the way that we do cybersecurity program audits and hopefully provide it as a tool for other organizations to use. Um, we want folks to use this. And also when we go to other agencies to do audits, we want you all to see what we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, the one thing to know about CPAG is although it has details and information in it, it's not intended to be all inclusive or comprehensive. There's a ton of cybersecurity guidance and criteria out there. And the idea of CPAG is only to provide a starting point and provide links to additional tools. We fully expect folks to use CPAG and then heavily modify what they take. And also, you know, we want you to really go to the source documents. Um, NIST uh, does great work. Um, the DISIS digs are great. And so there's no reason for us to reinvent the wheel by creating additional guidance. That's what we use when we do our work and uh, that's what we would direct you to do as well. <clears throat> so our goals with CPAG are hopefully to help, uh, you know, it gets back to those challenge areas. We hope that through our audits and evaluations and use of this tool, we'll be able to enhance security posture, better protect sensitive data, um, foster greater awareness of cybersecurity. Uh, and I think that's one thing we've seen recently is everyone is aware of cybersecurity now, even folks who don't have anything to do with cybersecurity because we've all been impacted by it. So, as I mentioned, CPAG points to a number of different criteria and provides information on how to do an audit and provides suggested audit steps, but just as a starting point. Um, now, let me stop for a second here. I'm going to share um, some other information. So, CPAG has a couple pieces to it. 
Um, the first is, uh, can I just get a thumbs up that you can see the PDF file here? Yep, thank you. All right, so I should have gone to the beginning. So if you go to the URL in the report, um, this is the PDF document. And for better or worse, we still issue stuff in PDFs. Um, we are working towards HTML issuance, but um, this is sort of the authoritative source. And you'll see there's a summary and I'll walk through all this information, but I just wanted you to see that there is a PDF where you can get all the details here. But in addition to the PDF, uh, there is, an Excel workbook, which in some ways is probably more useful. And what the Excel workbook has is uh, there's a cover sheet with some explanatory information, but for each chapter in CPEG, um, it lists different control objectives. So for example, determine if security control policies and procedures are appropriately implemented, for example, which is a, this is a pretty broad one. But for each of these, it lists some sample audit steps, and then it provides reference to additional criteria, support documents. Um, most notably, we refer to the NIST 853, and we'll mention the specific control families and control numbers. Um, and that's a good starting point. And if you use NIST, you know that there's also a 53, um, there's an assessment guide, which lists um, ways that you can evaluate. And you can use that, um, but sometimes there's there's almost too much there. So our, our idea here was to give you a starting point. But we also link to other NIST publications, uh, the NIST cybersecurity framework as well. Um, I'm gonna go to another section here. Uh, I'll make this bigger. Um, I'm trying to find another example here. So this is all NIST, but we have, um, that's okay, I won't try to find it. We also have links to DHS binding operational directives and OMB guidance as well here. So that's where you can find all of that information. And let me go back to my presentation now. Okay, I'm getting the hang of this. So if you've done auditing and evaluation for a while, you may know about an older geo publication called the FISCAM, and I just wanted to take a minute to talk about that. The FISCAM was created uh, when cybersecurity was still relatively a newer area. And the primary focus of the FISCAM was the cybersecurity auditing or information security auditing to support um, financial statement audits. Now, over time, since that was the only thing that was out there, uh, folks started using that for all sorts of audits. Um, and that's great. And if folks want to keep doing that, they can. But FISCAM was recently revised and it was reordered to match more closely GEO's financial audit manual. So folks using FISCAM, a lot of that is easier to do if you're doing financial statement audits. Um, so CPAG is a little bit different. What we did is we sent a questionnaire to existing users of FISCAM and asked for ideas on how to modify and improve it. Improve it. That included OIGs, um, IPA firms, state audit agencies. We had a number of focus groups, both internal GAO and with external entities. We also talked to organizations like CIS and ISACA. And um, we tried to come up with something that we thought would meet a lot of these needs. Now, the reality is um, it was hard to find something that really made everyone happy, and we probably didn't do that. But I think what we came up with works pretty well. Um, basically, what we came up with is a document that's organized into seven chapters. And the first chapter is uh, basically an overview of how to do the audit process. Those of you who are experienced doing cybersecurity audits could probably even skip that part. And then each of the remaining six chapters list different domain areas. And um, each domain area is, uh, is it relates to that Excel spreadsheet that I showed before. Um, so, um, Identity and access management is one, configuration management is one, and so on. Um, so that's basically what this slide says. And I went over the Excel spreadsheet, which I also think is useful. Um, one second. All right, so let's get into it. So I'm gonna provide an overview um, and Wes will provide some of the details as well for some of the subject matter areas. 
Um, so the first chapter talks about the overall audit process. And CPEG links to GAGIS, which is the generally accepted government auditing standard that GEO provides that most um, government audit agencies follow. But basically, we've broken the audit process into three phases, plan and design, perform, and report out. And we have a brief uh, explanation of each step in the process, but it's from a cybersecurity audit perspective. So, for example, um, reporting audit results, um, one of the issues with cybersecurity audits is figuring out how are you going to report out your results. Um, there's a balance there. If you issue a public report, it's going to get the widest visibility, but because cybersecurity vulnerabilities are sensitive, most organizations don't want too many details in that public report, right? So you have to kind of figure out, are you going to have, you know, a limited distribution report? Are you going to have two versions of the report? Um, and that's something that you actually need to think about upfront before you do your work. So you're not trying to play catch up at the end. So the first part of doing any audit is obviously determining your scope and boundaries. The reason we mention that is we don't expect that anybody would use all the chapters of CPAG in one audit. That would be in probably almost impossible to do. Based on your audit scope and boundaries, you would pick and choose the appropriate parts of CPAG to use. So, for example, if you felt like you needed to look at corrective action plans or plans of action and milestones, um, there's a portion of CPAG and this graphic explains um, what are some of the things that you would look at as in a POEM or corrective action plan related to system security plans, security assessment reports, prior audit results, and uh, waivers, for example. So you're going to prioritize based on your needs the parts of CPEG that you want to use. Um, I think we covered most of this, um, but this is basically the steps of doing an audit. Um, but let's go ahead and get into the more technical, the part, more of technical it. part of it. So, so let's see here. So, see here. so, so there's a there's number of different, a number of different areas here. Um, and uh, the first is asset and risk management, configuration management, identity and access management, continuous monitoring and logging, incident response, and contingency planning and recovery. Now, we don't have security management broken out as a separate area. Um, and we decided for this um, document to integrate it in. So you'll see for each of these domain areas, there's a step related to security management and policies and procedures. Um, that's something we may take another look at after we revise um, this. The CPAG is based on version 1.1 of the NIST cybersecurity framework. And we know that now that version 2.0 is out, we'll have to update this. So I talked about criteria. This lists some of the criteria we use from a government perspective. I'm going to pause here for a minute. Wes, do you think, can you talk about some of the more technical criteria and sources when you do your audit work? Yeah, so uh, I, I imagine that uh, chapter one being more of a audit 101, how to plan and perform and report your, your, your audit work. Uh, it seems like that that would be well aligned, hopefully, in the revision with uh, the, the CSF govern function. Uh, is it's it's almost like a full time job to keep uh, your criteria and plans up to date with all the current guidance and laws and regulations. Uh, at, at the White House level, we've got the executive orders that come out. Uh, uh, 14028, the improving the nation's cybersecurity uh, was a, kind of a, a big splash in that area, for sure. Uh, and then OMB, being a White House office, um, it, it issues the the memos frequently, um, like 2209 for zero trust, uh, 2131 uh, dealing with logging and and, and whatnot, um, uh, 2201. There, there's there's a bunch of them. Uh, a lot of people are probably familiar with some of those. Um, and then DHS has uh, CISA requirements that the, they've had their Zero, zero trust maturity model out there. Uh, they've got in, in encrypted DNS guidance uh, for impl implementation. Uh, there's their CDM program, the continuous diagnostic and mitigation. Um, and the cloud security reference architecture uh, documents from them, and of course all the 800 series public publications from from NIST, uh, and and those are all used as uh, as as really criteria for us uh, in our audits. Because uh, 
unless you have a, a benchmark of some sort, uh, you, you don't really have an audit. You have to have something, something that you're measuring uh, the, the state of affairs against uh, as, as a requirement. So anyway, that th those are just some of them. We cert certainly, each of the vendors have uh, hardening guide not guidelines of, of various sorts as well. So right. is that. Okay. Yep, thank you. Um, yeah. All right. Um, so let's talk about asset and risk management. This is the first area. Um, some of the key practices in this area, and I mentioned security management being integrated. Um, the number, the first one here is SSIT governance. Um, but we also look at the challenges related to asset management, having a risk management strategy, looking at risk, risk assessments. We talked about planes of action and milestones uh, and supply chain risk. And also we put security awareness and training in here as well. Um, Wes, do you want to maybe give an example of um, some audit work you've done in this area? Uh, sure. Um, so the the asset management is 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 kind of like what what are you trying to protect from from whom from whom for how long and at what cost? And uh, the biggest example I can think of uh, is automating the inventory of devices and software that the federal government has. Uh, like CDM does uh, with hardware and software asset management systems, um, and which we've we've looked at those uh, a number of times, and we keep trying to to help uh, push that that area forward. Uh, but we also need to inventory the data. Uh, there, there's demands in, in zero trust where we uh, we're required to start automated in an automated fashion, uh, tagging and classifying data. Uh, you know, kind of like hard, hardware or software, these are our assets also that need to be protected. So we need to you know, increasingly automate that functionality uh, of data tagging. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks. And let me, I think we have an example in here as well that we can walk through. So um, this again relates to how you might use the spreadsheet in CPEG. So if we're looking at policy and procedure implementation, if you go to the spreadsheet, you'll see some examples of audit procedures that you might follow um, and examples of control criteria that you would use as a standard um, when looking at an organization's um, basically implementation of effective policies and procedures. And this is this example is very kind of generic, but that was somewhat intentional. Um, so I think we, we kind of covered an example here of how you would use this. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go along the configuration management because that gets to again some more technical areas. Um, I saw we had a hand raised. Um, I think if it's okay, we'll try to allow time for Q and A at the end. Um, so um, configuration management. This looks at you know policies, plans, and procedures, but actual assessment of changes. Are changes documented and approved? Are software updates regularly applied? Are any emergency changes appropriately documented? Um, an example here, um, we talked about system inventory before, but part of configuration management is determining whether the configurations of the different inventory are actually documented and also accurate. And um, we often will find deficiencies here. Um, one of the things with CPEG is there is definitely overlap between the chapters and we know that. Um, but that's okay. Again, cybersecurity is not a cut and dried area. Um, Wes, can you maybe provide an example of some configuration management work you've done? Uh, sure, sure. So configuration management is usually about preventing or detecting a, a drift from a known or required state. So that the, any changes to the actual actual or required state are, are all approved and controlled. Um, so this could include just approving patches to system, uh, or maybe uh, you, you're, you're going to improve some other software installation or or change to to a, a get a, a git repo that kicks off some uh, CI/CD pipeline. So there's several common products in this area that people would use: Ansible and Puppet and Chef or CF Engine. Are, these are all products that that help enforce or push or revert some some configuration setting to an ex expected state. Uh, or we have SCAP scans uh, that measure compliance with some benchmark like a STIG or PCI or CIS. And those are essentially, those are just lists of configuration settings. 
uh, and and other uh, in enforcements of configuration would be something like your network only allows uh, an or approved device to connect to it. Um, yeah. And I think it, sometimes what think we sometimes find is these tools are these helpful, tools are but, really helpful, but sometimes there's gaps in where they're deployed, or um, you know, sometimes an organization will think they're making certain changes or preventing certain changes in areas, and they're not. So that's sometimes a lot of what we find. The, the tools are essential, obviously, for any large organization, but checking to make sure they're comprehensively implemented and the agency is aware of any gaps in implementation. <clears throat> the fourth chapter is probably the longest chapter in CPEG. Um, if you were familiar with FISCAM, this used to be largely the boundary protection area. Um, and this includes all kinds of things. Um, it includes boundary protection both on, on the network, but it also includes your identification authentication mechanisms, your physical security, um, issues related to data protection and privacy, and um, issues related to personnel, hiring, termination, transfer, looking at whether or not their roles and responsibilities have been appropriately um, provided and then removed when people go into and out of different roles. Um, Wes, what are some kind of key points in this area? Uh, this seems to go along the lines of the, uh, the protect function uh, in this uh, cybersecurity framework. Um, that, so identification uh, of users is, is, is how do we determine that the, the answer to the question, is this West? Yeah. Uh, whereas the, the the authorization is uh, answering the question: Is West permitted to access resource X over here, like a, a a particular system or database or or application or data file or column or even a cell within a database? Um, so I can well certainly belongs here the on onboarding of staff for verification of identity uh and centralization of uh, of identification systems uh, like active directory or ldap PK, pki um and, and that also would include things like uh adding or, or modifying uh, service accounts and machines and encryption keys and identi identity certificates uh, also kind of belongs here great thank you great. um so an example here might be if you're looking at network configuration segmentation. So <clears throat> the CPEG the uh, audit procedures in CPEG will talk about things like checking for access rights, checking uh, configurations of routers and firewalls. Um, this example is focused on access rights. That's a, a relatively easy thing for an auditor to check. Some of the router and firewall configurations can um, require a little bit more sophisticated knowledge for, for someone to look at. Um, chapter five is continuous monitoring and logging. And again, there's there's relationship between all of these things because what is the monitoring doing? Well, it's monitoring, you know, whether or not there's deviations from a configure um, from an approved configuration, for example. Um, and with logging, you have to have appropriate thresholds and tailoring of the logging to make sure the amount of data that is being logged is manageable um, and actually useful for um, either a tool or a person to look at. Um, so some of the key practices in this area are the overall strategy and implementation, the independent assessment process, <clears throat> any results, the comprehensiveness and accuracy of any automated monitoring tools, um, and the implementation of a logging tool. Um, I know a lot of times the problem is retaining all the information. So is an entity able to retain enough information that it's able to go back and do forensic analysis if it needs to? Wes, what else do you think is important in this area? Uh, well, well the, the bar has been raised a little bit, uh, or at least more broadly cast a, as, as a criteria. The, the, so the, the executive order 14028 uh, spawned a, uh, a specific OMB memo 2131 that spells out in, in great detail uh, what we're supposed to be uh, recording in, in terms of logs and centrally in, in central fashion so that we can uh, we can do machine learning and whatnot on those uh, to, to identify issues as early as possible. 
Uh, and it, it requires uh, logging at the operating system level, at database levels, at application levels, uh, and, and it talks about uh, requirements in terms of, uh, of retention of those logs as well. So uh, there, there's in, increasing, um, well, decreasing a, a discretion on that uh, because this, this is a you know, government-wide requirement. So what's your experience a, to the extent to which organizations are really able to to do these things, though? Uh, it's it's a journey for sure, uh, but the we we have seen agencies uh, working really hard to to achieve those those requirements, um, and in general, uh, the, the 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 progress is 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 very good. The the tools are out there uh, certainly uh, at the at the cloud level. And they're they're available within the systems that most of the agencies have on premise. So the, the capabilities are are, are generally there. Um, but in larger organizations like the DoD, uh, just the sheer size uh, makes it more difficult to do some of the higher level aggregations. But uh, it it's doable. Okay, um, so. Here's an example of something that uh, we often look at <clears throat> service provider connections is an organization aware of all the connections. Um, are they secured the way they think they are and the way they should be? Um, and are they being monitored? Um, we sometimes find that um, organizations have connections. They're either unaware of or aren't secure in a way that they thought they were. Um, and so that's often an area um, where we'll find issues for an audit. Um, chapter six, we talked about the importance of incident response. <clears throat> um, in this area, you know, as, as a, an evaluator, it's relatively easy to come in and request policies, plans, and procedures. Um, you can also look at testing. Um, you know, the, the incident monitoring can be a little more challenging because obviously um, exactly what you look at and what your thresholds are for taking action are going to very specific to the system or agency or network you're looking at. Wes, what are some uh, kind of important areas to keep in mind for incident response? Well, uh, security or orchestration um, uh, is, is is certainly a big deal. Uh, the the automation of of responses, uh, the the ability, for instance, to pull copies of of memory uh, or disk images uh, remotely uh, is important. Uh, and being able to create timelines with all the relevant logs of DNS or, or, or sessions like NetFlow, that's the source and destination date weight of a conversation over the network, uh, the, the EDR logs um, at the various layer, layers so that you can see attempts uh, at privilege, privilege escalation um, or entrenchment or data harvesting uh, and exfiltration attempts. Uh, and response also has to do with communication inside or outside your organization. Yep, that's definitely true, uh, especially in an era when most organizations are outsourcing increasing amounts of their IT infrastructure. So we talked about how you might look at testing and training. Um, you know, you can certainly, and we do this all the time, we come in and request records for training plans, um, training completion. We'll look at testing, um, test reports, and lessons learned and their implementation after the test reports. Um, um, but sometimes we'll find, uh, unsurprisingly, gaps in testing, sometimes due to lack of resources or just lack of management attention. Um, and that's often an area where we'll have a recommendation or a finding. Um, and then the last chapter is contingency planning and recovery, which is something we obviously all hope we never have to do, but once in a while we'll have to. So looking at those contingency plans, um, looking at um, the basically the ahead uh, ahead planning, and then also the testing of these plans. And then again, I, I mentioned before with incident response, implementation of any lessons learned, because um, obviously when these um, failover incidents happen, things often don't go exactly the way we thought they would. So can you learn from those issues? So this is another example, a common finding. 
we'll find that maybe there is a test done, but maybe the test doesn't actually provide a result that's in align with, um, aligns with what the department is looking for. Um, and uh, so, you know, we would recommend that an agency try to beef up its uh, testing and try to identify ways it could actually meet its recovery time requirements. So, um, as I mentioned, we've been doing audit work this way, uh, but not according, CPAC didn't exist. So now that it's out, we're trying to deploy it more formally internally. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we know we'll have to make some revisions to it. Um, we have, for example, an ongoing audit uh, of the National Background Investigation Service. Um, we're looking at some of the cybersecurity controls on their systems. Um, and so, as I mentioned, for every audit, we don't expect that any organization would use all of the chapters. So for this audit, we're focused on configuration management, identity and access management, and continuous monitoring and logging. Um, the state of Florida Office of Inspector General has been using CPEG as well uh, for some of its enterprise cybersecurity audits. And they found the tool helpful for kind of their overall planning activities, figuring out, making sure that their audit program is going to cover all of the areas they want it to cover in an audit cycle. Um, but again, you know, we know that this is just our first issuance of this, and we'll be looking forward to feedback from different organizations as it gets more used. Um, we'll go to Q and A in a minute here. Um, but well, actually, yeah, why don't we go ahead and do that now? We'll save the poll question. Um, I'm, I saw somebody had their hand raised and I don't know if they had a chance to put their question in the chat or in the Q and A. Um, but if you have questions, um, please go ahead and put them in the Q and A. Um, I see one question here, which, um, I may, um, defer it to Wes a little bit, but I can give a partial answer. And the question is, I've seen multiple programs where they met the required controls according to configuration analysis, but they were unable to detect even basic, basic attacks. <clears throat> what are your thoughts on including red team testing prior to accrediting a system? Um, I'll start and then, uh, West um, can fill in. Um, I think you're right that controls can be in place and attacks can go unnoticed. Um, however, part of what you'd hope to see with incident response testing is <clears throat> testing examples of attacks that should be detected. Um, whether or not you do red team, red teaming, um, red teaming can definitely be useful, but it's resource intensive and it's not always feasible to do it for every system. Um, our experience has been agencies are pretty challenged just trying to get the basics done. So I'd be hesitant to formally require um, red team testing for every system. But Wes, you may have different thoughts on this. Thoughts on this. Uh, sure, thanks. The, uh, so attacks don't get worse. They just get better over time. And uh, I, I appreciate the fact that we've got uh, increasingly um, while well, we're trying to raise the bar increasingly with, with all this uh, guidance that we talked about that, that keeps changing on us with, you know, now we have the zero trust guidance and, you know, and the, the, the executive order and whatnot. Uh, so when you think about things, so things like red teaming that uh, that kind of tests the, uh, the, the, the tester almost. Uh, whereas uh, there's there, there's this increasing idea of, of purple teaming, where you can take discrete uh, things that a, a, a discrete type of attack. Uh, if you look at uh, MITRE has uh, an a, a attack uh, matrix that it it has that explains the kill chain, uh, you know the, the the different ways that an attacker needs to to do reconnaissance and gain a foothold and whatnot. Uh, and there's all these different techniques that, that, that support uh, that process. And, uh, and and we get chan chances as defenders to to detect that or stop that any al anywhere along the way. Uh, so uh, the, there, there are discrete tests that you can uh, take out of that uh, attack framework. And as, as a tester, uh, uh, in conjunction with, with the folks that are doing defense for a particular uh, network you can say okay you should be able your systems according to the the way they're set up you should be able to uh detect this this sort of 
uh, attack. Let's throw one of these very specific attacks. Do you see it? You know, uh, and or, or can you stop it? Uh, and sometimes they will be, will be able to, and sometimes they won't. But but seeing something documented is different from actually testing it and making sure that that all the folks uh, that, that are involved in the in the de defense process uh, you know, they, they know what they actually can see and what they can stop. So they know where their gaps are and what, where they need to apply more controls. Okay, thanks, West. Um, I see a question here about whether or not we're involved with CMMC. So um, the short answer is no, not from an audit perspective. We actually do have work um, both completed and underway where we're looking at DOD's implementation of CMMC, um, but we're certainly not doing any evaluation of individual organizations. Um, there's a question here, um, which I'm not sure, um, I'll read it and Wes, I'm not sure if you fully understand it, but the question is, how do you perform a checklist control based audit to systems that have effectively applied NIST 800-160 and therefore have effectively eliminated risk errors through design and therefore the controls do not apply? Um, I'm yeah I'm I'm not quite sure about that. Um, I would say any any system is going to have um, a system security plan and a list of uh, ways that different controls have been implemented, and that would provide a starting point as far as uh, your test plan. Um, I don't know, Wes, if you have more thoughts on that. Or there there may be some controls that that do not apply. Uh, because there's things that cannot go go wrong with a particular system safety system, but that that doesn't mean exempt from it's exempt from from doing uh, uh, control reviews on it. Um, now there may be it. Uh, it sounds like he's trying to describe some sort of systems uh, that that actually fall outside of the scope of of some of these the, these checklists. Uh, if, if your management has determined that, that, for instance, a stick does not apply to a particular system, they'll have to justify that. Right. And sometimes we'll, we'll take a look at the, you know, management justification for risk-based deviations or waivers from security standards. Um, the next question here is, do you have any guidance for auditing the continuous, continuous integration, continuous delivery CICD pipeline? Um, and I'm not sure I have, do you have anything on that, Wes? Uh, yeah, so sure. There, there's, uh, there, there's lots of places where things can go wrong. Uh, but certainly the, so there's a, the, the DevOps, uh, sort of way of doing business is becoming more and more popular. Uh, we need to help ensure that that security is embedded in that, uh, as in DevSecOps so that security is actually part of the pipeline. Uh, now that said, the, each component of the pi pipeline you know, you can be evaluated uh, for its security uh, measures that it's taken to protect itself as well. Uh, but, but certainly uh, we, we look at the, you know, all, all the way from, from soup to nuts, you know, are, are the different uh, images signed uh, you know, are the uh, updates uh, that that go into uh, a, a Git repo, you know, uh, authorized appropriately? Have uh, have the different security checks? Have there been are are there robust security checks uh, in, included in the pipeline before something is able to move forward in that pipeline uh, for deployment? Right, and actually, NIST has guidance on um, secure software development framework, right? that I think is relatively new, and that might be a starting point. Um, so we're, we've got about five minutes left, so I'm gonna stop on the Q&A and just go back, and why don't we just do our last poll question here. Um, just, we're kind of curious, what do you think we need to be paying more attention to as auditors if you just had to pick one? And I realized that, you know, there was originally an all of the above choice in here, and I took it off because I wanted to force your hand, so. 
tell us where you think we need to focus as auditors uh, going forward. And while that poll question is running, uh, I think you can still see the choices. So I'm gonna go ahead and move to a different slide. Just to let you know, we know we need to revise this tool. Um, we are curious to get your feedback. Um, the team mailbox is cpag at geo.gov. I know there was a comment on there about not having West email. If you shoot me an email, I'll be happy to pass it along to West. Um, you can also see my colleague Jennifer and who worked on this and Tammy. Um, but if you shoot any of us an email, um, we'll try to get back to you. Uh, and if you have general feedback, if you could send it to the CPAG mailbox, we're just trying to store that for our future revision. Um, so let's see here. How are the answers coming in? Oh, it's hard for me to see this whole thing. <sighs> Somebody could probably guess my email is just last name, first initial at yes, there you like, go. like the rest of the folks. Exactly, so, exactly. It's, it's, exactly. it's not a secret. All right. Well, it looks like uh, most folks think we should worry about AI, although it could be an AI tool that answered the quiz questions for you. So, um, but uh, we agree, we have a lot of we have a lot of odd work underway related to AI, and it's gonna be interesting to see how AI, once AI is deployed more from a cybersecurity perspective, how um, how we audit it. And that's something I think we're still gonna have to figure out. Um, with that, Phil, is there anything that we missed? I know we're kind of at the end of time here. First thing I would like to thank you and Gail for, uh, for the time and, and effort into supporting the CSI webinar. Um, I think this was a, a great presentation. Also, like the, the interactive nature with the polls. Um, for all the attendees, please fill out the, the surveys and let us know if you would, if you would like uh, more polling done and if you have other topics that you would like for us to address. Um, I think we're able to get to uh, almost all of the questions. We do have one last one in the chat. Um, since we don't have a hard stop at one. Um, I'll, I'll read that question to you guys and give you the opportunity to, to answer that last one before uh, before we hang up on the call. So this last question is from Christine. She said she would be interested in your perspective on auditing national security systems where there is a reliance on security in depth, uh, polygraphs, background checks, secure facilities, secure comm, encryption, et cetera, as a mitigation to some of the information security controls and monitoring. Yeah, that's a great question, um, but it sounds like the questioner probably knows, knows almost as much about this as we do in the sense that we often find with some of these systems, because they are sensitive and it's hard to update them, that they have gaps in their implementation of controls. And so their compensating control is some of the things you mentioned. Well, we've got, you know, it's behind a series of physical barriers. Um, the folks that are using it are carefully screened and so on. And so, you know, the answer is, of course, it's, it's a holistic viewpoint, right? It's a, it's a, in aggregate, do you think that these controls are effective? Um, and then you just, you have to look at the trade-offs. How hard would it be to implement some of these controls? You know, what, what would be involved in a system upgrade? So I don't think, um, I don't have a simple answer to you. I think that the, the answer is yes. You're right. That is a challenge, um, and it's a little. It's always going to be a, a bit of a judgment call um, based on management's determination of risk. Wes, any thoughts on that? Uh, well, we're increasingly moving towards uh, an, an environment where we, are, are with zero trust, where we're not supposed to trust that necessarily um, their perimeter boundaries are doing everything, or maybe even air gaps are doing everything that we're we hope that they would. Uh, so, uh, a, a better place to be is, is to secure the systems in spite of the perimeter controls that may or may not uh, be effective. Yes, I agree with you. That's the, that's the ideal case. <laughs> I think we have a ways to get there, though. All right, well, with that, I think we're at time, and it sounds like the leaf blowers have arrived outside my window. So, um, <laughs> it's probably time for us to wrap up for today. So thank you very much, everyone. We appreciate it. All right. Thanks all. Hopefully we see you on the next CSI webinar. And thanks again Sounds to good. JL.